when your first introduction on needle and peds intubation. We don't have peds up there because mostly we'll focus on needle. Peds probably a lot more similar to adults than needle, but like George said, tons of similarities and a few differences. So I'm going to pick your brain a little and get you to think about what those similarities and differences are. Okay. Um, my kids wanted me to put their pictures in. That's not true. <laughs> Outline today. So what are we going to talk about? So we'll talk about basic pediatric. So I use the term pediatric generally, so neopedes, anything that's not an adult anatomy. And have you guys had a little bit of that so far in your anatomy classes? Nothing really? No airway anatomy yet? Okay. So we'll take a look at that. Um, oral nasal airway sizing and insertion. So when you look at intubating an adult, we generally use the same size too for men, women, all that sort of stuff, adults of general size. When you get into populations that are neonatal and pediatric, obviously the varied size from very, very tiny to almost adult size. So we'll go over how you're gonna size these two. Okay. Also, the difference between neo and adult intubation, indications for intubation. Uh, two different ways to intubate a neo and a pediatric, obviously an adult as well, but you'll find neonatal intubation a little bit more common in that population. Using cuffed versus uncuffed tubes, sizing, and the step-by-step -step procedure. If we have enough time in the end, we can have one of you come up and try and do this with your assistant. Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about security too. Okay. So I know this is your first introduction. There's going to be some new material that's brought up <coughs> here. As we go through, if you have questions, just stop me and we'll talk about them sort of in a moment. I think it's probably best. Okay. All right. And like I said, if there's time, we'll do it demo. Okay, so if you think about a pediatric and a neonatal um, individual, their anatomy is going to be a little bit different. Oh look, do you know what? I grabbed the box. And <laughs> There's no baby in here. It's because they're invisible. Babies are invisible. Doesn't matter what size things. Preemie and would be best, but it doesn't matter. I'm so glad Cliff's here today too. Don't um, talk about anything important while I'm gone. Don't worry, I don't. <laughs> uh, so, to start off, neonates, I don't know, has anyone seen Hell the Real Live Baby? Yes. Yeah. Most of you, right? Um, if you have, you'll notice their tongues occupy almost their entire oral cavity, right? So, relative to, to the space in there, their tongues are larger, and that inherently makes intubation a little bit more difficult, okay? So, there's less room in there for the stuff that you want. They also have a larger occiput. So does everybody know what an occiput is? Does someone point to their occiput? Everybody has one. Anyone know? This is the back of your head. Right? So this is your occiput here. So if you've um, seen a baby recently, take a peek at them the next time you see one and notice that they have a very prominent occiput. And that becomes impactful when you try and position them. Right? So positioning is super important for intubation. And that changes the way you'll position them. Uh, in, contrast to when you position an adult. Okay. So the natural position, because of the socks of when you're lying flat, is actually picture it. It's going to be function, right? Uh, what do you think we could do to maintain airway neutrality if my occiput is big and my head is flexible? So where do you put a rule for adults? position their head forward sniffing position. Does that ring a bell when I say sniffing position? Yes. Okay, so you're going to put sort of a pad underneath their head because their occiput isn't as prominent and they've got bigger shoulders, sometimes rounded shoulders, so that positions them up this way. Whereas when you have um, a neo or a pediatric patient, you're going to need to put the rolls in a different place. Okay. So, for instance, bigger occiput, maybe you would require a shoulder roll. Okay. So if I had a little guy here to demonstrate, I'd actually buff them up. But let's see how one put it. We can go from there. Okay, there are some actual airway differences as well. So as you grow, your structures not only grow in size, but they also change in their um, actual, what's the word I'm looking for, dimensions. Okay. So the narrowest part of an adult airway. Does anyone know what that is? Glottis. Glottis. Okay. So where is the glottis? 
Perfect, right? At the very top of the tree, yeah. Where is the narrowest portion of a NEOP area? So it's not right? The cricoid, right? So big hand knocked a lot of us, so the cricoid. Um, and what is the cricoid? Does anyone describe it for me? Yeah. Perfect. So it's that complete ring that goes around your trachea. So in an adult uh, airway, this they're not cone shaped, they're straight up and down, that cricoid cartilage would be the same as your thyroid, would be the same distance. And it's the glottis that's the narrowest. But in the peats are more of a cone shape. So that cricoid cartilage is actually the narrowest part of the airway. Okay. Uh, the trachea is also, like I just said, more funnel shaped and more of a cone shaped. And their epiglottis is also not really formed in structure. So it's a lot bigger and a lot floppier compared to the adult one. So here's a couple pictures of what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you found your... Oh, what's wrong? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this is Baby Anne. I don't know if you've met Baby Anne yet. She's one of our um, littlest, most realistic mannequins that you can So she's pretty tiny. She represents about a 600 gram EOP. Okay? So they do come this little. They actually come a little bit smaller than this. So you can imagine the difficulty increases not only because she's premature, she's got that bigger mouth, she's got a narrow quick cartilage, but also because she's so tiny, right? So, I don't know if everybody can see from there, but essentially when, she, when she's lying flat, her occiput will tip her head into flexion, okay? So, would this work as a rule? No, it's good to do, right? So you're gonna go for something smaller. So, I've got a pillowcase and a face cloth here, right? So where do you think this rule needs to go to extend her neck? Her shoulders, yeah. And it doesn't have to be very big, right? There. Definitely more aligned, okay? So for those of you who can't see, so initially, She's like this, you put that roll down in place and you align up her axis. I have another picture coming that will show you the axis. So again, this picture displays it as well. You see the shoulder roll there allows for that occiput to drop and line up those airway axes. You can also see the section here where it shows inside the child airway versus inside the adult airway. The tongue is much larger. The space in there is just physically smaller, right? And the narrowing of the airway, which happens down in this, in this part. Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so more pictures here. <laughs> A better picture of how that is cone or funnel shaped going down there um, versus the adult on the left. Right, so that's straighter structure. Children are not a ton different, but children you're just gonna have to assess, right? So do they have a big occiput? Were they really good sleepers on their back and their parents listen very well to that SIDS back to sleep? And do they have this flat, flat head that requires a little bit of support underneath there? Well, one of the most important things you can do as an RT uh, is assess. Right? So you're going to assess your patient to decide what you need to do. You're going to intervene. And then you're going to reassess. Did you actually do what you wanted to do? So this is a good example of that. So you look at this patient, the little boy, and you think, huh, his head's in a flex position. I need to support him. Then you'll find a way to support him. So you'll either decide on a shoulder roll or a pad underneath the head. Then you're going to take another look. Did I actually do what I wanted? We'll talk a little bit about oral airways. Mm -hmm. um, I know, is that you're still your first PA? Insertion in an oral airway? Yeah. Okay. Anyone stress out over that one? Yeah. <laughs> you haven't done it yet? Okay. So you've all talked about insertion of an oral airway, okay? Sizing of the airway. It is no different in an, ad, uh, in an adult as it is in a neonatal pediatric. So how do we size an oral airway? Yeah, so I see lots of you pointing. Great, you're here. Essentially, the, ba the bottom of that oral airway. Okay. 
this part of the oral airway here. The brain is so funny. You're aiming for the posterior face, right? So it's going over the tongue, and this part is sticking out of the mouth. So if we can use Anna for a minute. So you have her here, here to the mouth. So this would be an appropriate size for her. Almost even a little bit bigger. The one thing that you need to consider though is in an adult, you would typically usually pop it in upside down and roll over the back of the tongue and then turn it over. On the kids, you'll find that because their tongue is so big, it really blocks the progressive this oral airway. So you'll hold the tongue down and actually just slide it in. You can use a tongue depressor, you can use your finger or your thumb, um, and insertion the right side up. Also, their soft palates are really delicate, so you don't want to be pushing this along the top of their soft palate. Okay. NPA. Have you talked about NPAs yet? A little bit. So why would we use an NPA? Does anyone have an indication? Yep. Frequent suctioning. Yep. So if there's trauma to the mouth, then you need to provide some sort of airway for them if there's oral swelling. Semi-conscious, right? So they're having some obstruction, so to bypass that obstruction, okay? The indications for that for a neonate are no different, okay? So if you have a neonate who is obstructing, who has some congenital abnormalities, so their jaw is small, their tongue is big, they're really struggling to maintain that airway, and NPA is the same thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about intubation. So, if I were to ask you the difference between adult and neo intubation, can anyone come up with any? I have probably eight or nine bullets here. So, any difference you can think of. That's right, so your tube's going to be different. So, neonatal intubation, we typically will use untucked tubes. Okay? Smaller tubes. Yeah, very much so, for sure. Smaller tubes. George said you probably haven't seen tiny tubes yet. looks like a good size for Anne. If you look at a six and a half or a seven tube, that would be the size of Anne, right? So you have to obviously get smaller. As they get narrow in diameter, they also get shorter because you don't need the length, right? So your insertion depth is something to consider too. It's a smaller tube. Perfect. Anything else? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so in here. smaller than this, they get about half the size, so double zero. This one's actually probably too big for Anna. Okay, so this is a Miller blade, right? So how do we use these differently? Yeah, so you're, you're aiming to actually pick up that floppy at the glottis and get it right out of the way instead of having to rely on going in that molecular and lifting it up. Because it's floppy, it doesn't actually lift the same, so that's why it's easier to do. Okay, anything else? Briefly touched on it before, but sometimes when you're intubating neo impedes, which way do you go? In the middle. What's that? In the middle? Yeah, so you can go in the middle, but not only can you go in the mouth, sometimes you go through the nose, right? So that complicates things a little bit. It's not as easy. It takes a little bit more time to do that. Okay? Let's see. Uh, think about securing devices for adults. Lots of different devices that you can use, right? So securing that little in bitty tube, how much play do you think you have on the tube? You know what I mean by play? So when you secure an adult tube and you're changing tapes and that sort of thing, you've got a little bit of movement, right? You don't want to move it around too much, they can cough. But if you think about this and the size of her little airway and how much beyond the cords you are, your play is a little bit different. So you have to make sure these tubes are secured at all times. Okay. Let's see if we miss it. Smaller tube we got difficult to take, often nasal, uncuffed, Miller, and significant anatomy differences that we talked about already, right? 
So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a difficult airway. There are some things that do make it more difficult, but it's different. And I think if you consider that, you go in prepared, and the more prepared you are, the easier things get. Can anyone give me indications for intubating a cat? Say it loud and proud. So when are you intubating a cat? Surgery. Surgery, for sure. So what happens when they have surgery? What do we do to them? Yeah, we sedate them, so we anesthetize them. So somebody with an altered level of consciousness, whether that's us or them, induced, right, we're going to need to secure that area. Put up. Respiratory failure. For sure, respiratory failure. Okay. Anything else? So what about if they have a ton of secretions that they're unable to clear? Right. What happens if they're not really awake enough due to respiratory failure or due to a head injury? How is their ability to protect their airway? These indications aren't really different than uh, adult versus new They're going to be the same. Okay. There's a couple more that we add in here. So depressed respiratory cardiac status, but usually this happens at some point. Surfactant therapy. Do you guys know what surfactant is? Yeah, Have you learned about surfactant? Okay. So when you're born premature, like Anna is, you just don't have enough, and sometimes that supplemental surfactant. We need to get it, okay? And you can, um, the way we deliver it now is with uh, an endotracheal tube and a device that, that actually puts this into the endotracheal tube. Other medication delivery. I know you probably haven't, you haven't done NRP yet. You no, know, nothing like that. So um, it's also a way to deliver medication. Okay, congenital anomalies, right? As you go through your courses, you'll learn a few more congenital anomalies that interfere with your ability to maintain an airway, protect an airway. Okay. Other indications. So we talked a lot about the adult indications. Those aren't different than pediatrics and neonates. Okay, something like high pressure to ventilate them. Uh, access to the lower airway for suction, airway protection, right? Those things are similar. We're all over Okay, so we need to decide when we're intubating the neonate or pediatric if we're going to go oral or nasal. Each of them has its pros and cons, and as you get more familiar with um, this population, you'll be able to make that assessment and decision as well, okay? So do you guys know what McGill forceps are? Yeah. So you need those McGill forceps to do your nasal intubation. And again, it takes a little bit more time. Uh, and have you learned anything about ventilator-acquired pneumonia? A little bit. So there are things and strategies that we do to help prevent that. One of them is not putting a tube in somebody's nose. Okay, so that actually will increase your risk of ventilator yeah. However, why do we still do it then? There are cons, okay? It's more secure, like I said, there's there's very little play in these tubes when they're in a good position and when they're not in a good position, so they can be easier to secure. When babies are born, uh, and especially when they're born prematurely, we want to avoid putting things in their mouth that interfere with things that are that come naturally, like reflexes. So the suck-swallow reflex is really important for them to maintain, and having a tube in their mouth can really interfere with that. Uh, and we also want to settle babies. You'll find that they don't actually use a ton of sedation in children if they can settle them without them, and pacifiers can help that. That actual suck reflex can help settle them as well. So without a tube in there, you have the ability to still use a pacifier. All right, now let's talk cuffed versus uncuffed. So traditionally, in neonates and pediatrics even, we've used uncuffed tubes, okay? Do you guys know why? Yeah, for sure. So with that cup, along with that cup comes pressure on the, on the mucosa around there, right? It's developing. Their perfusion isn't as great, so they don't tolerate that pressure on the edge of the mucosa very well like adults do, okay? Um, why else did we not? 
Think about the anatomy. Did we need to? You may not need one, right? I have two on that. What's that? Yeah, because it's a funnel shape. That narrowest part is at the cricoid cartilage, and that often will form a really good seal around the tube, so you don't need to look at okay? You'll find that most of the time, especially in the premature environment, that these premature kids and neonates don't have a cut tube. Okay? As they grow, become term, age, still are intubated, you may switch to a cup tube if there is still a leak. There's new developments in cups as well. So your typical um, low volume, high pressure cups are hard on the airways, but they now develop micro cup tubes or low pressure cups as well that are easier on that mucosa. So it does give us an option if we need to use a cup tube. So talking a little bit more about advanced neonates. So remember back in the objectives I said we talked about how you size tubes. So where do you even start? Okay. Um, I borrowed this slide from an NRP manual and it talks about intubation recommended before chest compressions. So at this point it's not a typical intubation, it's a resuscitation intubation. So you need to know really quickly what size you're going to use. And they actually have a chart for that, right? It is based on both gestation uh, and your baby's weight. So sometimes weight, you don't have time to weigh them, you're gonna estimate them. And the people who are in the living rooms get really, really good at estimation. Okay. Um, we also have the option of using an LMA, which I won't touch on too much today. Um, and the depth of insertion, right? The depth of insertion can be really, really important if you put your tube in too deep, then your right main stem, you're not gonna ventilate very good, um, and there's a risk. And the risk is inherently larger with neonates because it just isn't that much distance, right? So we actually have a very good way to estimate that length on a newborn baby, and that's called uh, a nasal tragus link. So the nasal septum to the tragus of the ear, and you have the plus one. And that has shown in lots of research lately to be a good depth for that too, okay? But you also wanna make sure you confirm that depth by chest x-ray, just like you would in an adult. So the size selection, again, is based on both weight and gestational age. All right, advanced airways pediatrics. Pediatrics are complicated in the sense that their teeth are adult size, but their mouths are not. So they can be a little bit tricky. That's where technique comes in handy. Don't worry, he's grown into his teeth. <laughs> so we use formulas. Uh, you'll find that there's a ton of weight-based formulas when it comes to pediatrics, not only in medication deliveries, but also in tube sizing, tube depth, um, and all sorts of interventions that we do to them. So if you're choosing an uncuffed tube, you're going to use your Quine formula. If you're using a cuffed tube, you'll use a different formula, okay, so the modified formula. Obviously with a cuff, you're going to need a little bit of a smaller tube. Okay. And the depth, so you hear me talk about a vocal cord marker. See this black line there? That's actually a vocal cord marker. So if this is placed at the vocal cords, you have a very specific depth beyond that vocal cord. Okay? So that's what a vocal cord marker is. Different manufacturers, they look different. Some of them are a dot, some of them are a single line, some of them are a double line. So that's where knowing your equipment's really important as well. Okay. There's also uh, a formula, we have formulas for everything, so H divided by two plus 12, or you can do your internal diameter times three, okay? As you go through your child health management class, Brittany will walk you through the formulas that we use, and uh, you'll get more used to using this formula. Procedure, okay. So whenever we make an intervention as a respiratory therapist, we follow a certain procedure. So where do we start? You guys have a template that you follow with procedures? Very important orders. Yeah, so you want to make sure you're doing the right thing to the right patient. Do you guys have something called a preparation template? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that involves a bunch of pre-described steps. Okay. So when you're preparing to intubate, step one, you're going to gather your equipment. Okay. What equipment do we need? Obviously, so every time you do something as an RT, you need equipment, right? Where our hands are a little bit tied without equipment when we're trying to make interventions. The way I like to formulate my equipment list in my head is in a very logical order. 
So I'm going to go through the procedure in my head and gather my equipment as I go through that procedure and then hopefully I won't forget. Okay? I think coming up with a system that's yours, that you know, that is logical, can really help you moving forward and keeping track of all the things that you need. So gathering equipment, if you go through your procedure, hopefully you won't forget something. Okay, so that's why this is in this order. All right, so when you decided that you need to intubate somebody, obviously they require a tube for whatever reason. So if you're providing positive pressure ventilation on them already, you will need a bag and a mask. If you haven't been, you will still need a bag and a mask because as soon as you give them medication, you're going to need to take over their ventilation prior to putting that tube in. So bag and a mask. So after you do that bag and a mask, what's next? So what's the first thing that goes in the mouth? perhaps you're going to take a peek and you're going to need to suction them. So that's exactly right. Okay. And then after you clear their airway, you're going to stick their laryngoscope in with the appropriate size blade on them. Okay. Hopefully that will give you a good visualization of their airway and their cords. Okay. Then you're going to take your appropriate size endotracheal tube and half size smaller. Why do you need a half size smaller? Just in case it's a good fit, right? You'll find, though, that once you hit your lower limit of two and a half, there is nothing smaller. So you're just going to take your two and a half, okay? Uh, we've also got something else that we need before we insert this in. What do we need in here? A stylet. Yeah, for sure you need a stylet. Unless you're going nasal. So if you're going nasal, you don't put a stylet in because you don't want it stiff. You want it to bend around the nasal face. Okay? So you have your stylet. So what do we put on this tube before we put it in? Lubricant. Have you heard people call it MUFO? Right? So if you hear us old people call it MUFO, that's the brand name it used to be. So if you're on site and somebody says, pass me the MUFO, they're not trying to go MUFO mist or something like that. It's just a water-based lubricant. Okay? Also, if you're using a cup tube, you're going to need a syringe. Okay. So here we are. We have our tube. We have our stylet. Right? And let's say we're going nasal, so we don't have our stylet. So our tube goes in, we have our laryngoscope in, we're visualizing. What's next? We go forceps. Exactly, so you're going to have those up there. You're going to slide that in. So now our tube's in place, okay? So we're holding our tube at the patient. What's after? What do we need to do now? Yeah, so your stylet's out. So now what do we do? So you need to secure it, okay? So how do we secure it? I have tubes there. There's something that comes just before there. We have to check the measurement. So you're going to check the measurement, right? So you're going to put it into the right depth. You've already done your calculation, okay? You're happy with where it is, okay? So how, when you're going to secure it to the face, do the tapes go right on the face? No. no. What do we put in between? Do you know the name of it? It's called Zoolder. So it's a, it's a product. It actually looks something like this. There's a couple different manufacturers that have it, but essentially it's there to protect the skin of the baby. Because if you imagine, especially a preterm baby, their skin isn't even really formed, you need to protect it. It's called duoderm. Yeah. And you're going to tape it. And what are you going to do after you tape it? You're going to assess whether it's in the right spot. You'll probably actually do that before you tape it. As soon as it goes in, you're going to assess. How do you assess for the right spot? Chest rise? Condensation? I heard you say x ray. Yeah. Yeah, and, and tidal CO2. So you have lots of different ways to check. The first and most important is those first few breaths that go in, you should see chest rise. What kind of chest rise? Equal bilateral chest rise, right? Also, you're going to need your personal protective equipment. So what does that include? Gloves, glasses. I did hear gown. You probably won't see people wear their gowns, but masks, okay? So intubation is one of the most high-risk activities for contamination between patient and caregiver. Because think of how close you are, right? So if I'm intubating this little baby, I'm crouched down right here, right? looking directly in their mouth, looking at their uh, looking at their airway, it's a big risk for contamination. So mask, glasses, or a mask with a shield, okay, gloves. Are you gonna see that in your practice? Hopefully, right? Perfect, so we've got our equipment. 
Um, the reason why I went through the equipment with the procedures because that's how I go through it and that's how I remember stuff and that's how you don't forget stuff, okay? So you gathered your equipment. You're gonna check your equipment, right? What good is your equipment if your cuff is blown, if your light doesn't work, right? If your stylet's so bent that you can't get it in or out of the tube, okay? So you're also gonna make sure your suction is set appropriately and working and you wanna make sure your recess tier is actually working. Oh, I have a little section here. What FO2 should we, um, I have a bag, but what FO2 should we use it on our resuscitators? Sometimes, yeah. Depends on why you're intubating, right? Um, neonates and newborn babies, they know too much oxygen isn't good for them, right? So it changes things within the brain, it changes blood flow within the brain, and within the lungs. So sometimes you need to mitigate that O2 to make sure you don't wash it. Pediatric patients, it's a little bit less of a concern, okay? So then you're gonna maximize hydroxygenate just like you would an adult, unless there's something like a special consideration, so a cardiac defect, something that high oxygen would harm them, okay? All right, procedure, explain the procedure. So you're gonna intubate this baby, he actually looks quite well, I'm not sure why you'd intubate him, but if you were going to intubate this baby, how do you explain the procedure to baby? You'd probably just explain it to the, yeah, the parents. Okay, so position. We've talked a little bit about positioning already with your uh, with your baby. A good position is usually when the ear canal is aligned with the sternum in neonates. What does that look like? I think I have a picture after here, right? So you see that there's a correct position there where your ear, you see my little mouse there, so your ear is lined up across with your sternum. So easier to see here, okay? Here in line with your sternum. This one, hyperextension. This one, flexion. So again, you're going to decide what you're gonna to use to support them, whether it's a shoulder roll or a head roll for a pediatric or even an adult if you're putting them in a sniffing position. Then you're gonna look back at them again and make sure you did what you intended to do. So are they now in good alignment, okay? So I talked a little bit about the axis here. So there's three different axes. Do you guys know what the O is? Oral, yeah, oral pharyngeal. Oral, B, I just skipped it. Pharyngeal, right? Tracheal, okay? So these three axes line up perfectly in neutral position, okay? So that's what you're aiming for with positioning. Because if your patient is in good position, you won't need to manipulate that airway very much to be able to get a good visualization, okay? So again, neutral position in the middle here versus this position here, okay? So the closer those axes are, the better. Okay, so we need to medicate or anesthetize the airway just like you do in an adult, okay? Um, do we anesthetize the airway or the patient in babies? you're probably gonna to need to tie the patient instead of the airway, okay? So why do you think that is? So remember we talked about the neonatal airway is different from the adult airway, okay? Does it make it more challenging? It's a little bit more challenging. So you wanna remove those challenges, okay? So anesthetizing the patient makes the patient still, and it makes them easier to ventilate as well, okay? And you can't tell a baby to hold still for a pediatric patient. So it's usually more effective to immunize the patient. Okay. Um, we need other medications, okay? Have you guys talked about any medications at all? In your anatomy class, have you talked about nervous innervation? So your vagus nerve, have you talked about the vagus nerve? It's ringing a bell. What's the vagus nerve do? Do you know where it goes? It's in the glottis, yeah. And what does it do when you stimulate it? Okay, and what else? <clears throat> it decreases your heart rate. So I'm messing around in this little guy's airway and I knock into that vagus nerve. What's gonna happen? Just so they're sedated and paralyzed. But what am I doing when I knock into that vagus? I'm gonna drop their heart rate, right? So we need to give them something to keep that heart rate up. That's called atrophy. So atropine is a vagolytic, meaning that it actually knocks out that innervation to the vagus nerve. So when you go in there and you're messing around, 
it's not going to cause any increase in heart rate because you've given medication to do that. When you give this atropine, whether you're messing around with your vagus nerve or not, it will probably cause a rise in your heart rate simply because heart rate is based on a balance, right? So a balance between the vagus nerve stimulating and your cardiac pacemaker stimulating, right? So you knock out this, and then it's naturally going to rise a little bit because this is what's bringing it down, okay, to that level. Anytime we would not use medications, we're doing an RSA. Think about an adult. When would you not even bother to need to tie the patient? Mm, not necessarily. I think I heard it. Right, so if they're actually unconscious or dead already, right? So if they don't have a heart rate, they don't have um, a blood pressure, if they're actually have no LOC, then you don't need to use those patients, right? Okay. Right. So step six, hyperoxygenating event. We talked a little bit about this with you. Sometimes there's um, considerations involved that where you don't want to hyperoxygenate, but just remember to use the appropriate F5233 patient. All right, then we're actually going to intubate. Okay. The procedure shouldn't look much different than it does for an adult. So if you're pre-oxygenating, you have an assistant with you. So they have, um, they have control of that airway right now. They're going to ask who's ever intubating if they're ready, okay? Because you're not going to withdraw your current support unless your person ready to put the tube in is actually ready, okay? When you're in the middle of doing this, there's a few steps that both people have to take. Okay? The insertion should take at least 20 seconds or less. Uh, once it's inserted, the appropriate technique is used to expose the cords. Okay? So do we sweep, where is the lower risk for right hand, left hand? Well, left hand. So is that different in neos? No, it's exactly the same. Uh, you'll find that there's probably less of a sweep right to left, but at the same time, you're going to make sure you trap that tongue in there and get beyond there, okay? And then your endotracheal tube goes to the right marking that you've pre-decided, right? Then once your tube's in, you're going to double check it and look to make sure it is what it's supposed to be, okay? Again, we talked about how we assess tube placement. So how do we ensure? Chest rise? Condensation. Condensation. Chest x-ray? Right? Chest x-ray usually comes way down the road. You shouldn't need a chest x-ray to determine if your tube's in or not, right? Okay. The other thing that we haven't listened to, how do you tell if it's in the right side or in both sides, equal bilateral? How do we tell if we have equal bilateral hair treatment? Yeah. You also will take it, right? You, everybody, all RTs carry it around their neck and sometimes you forget to use it. That's one of the best things that you have at your fingertips, and post-intubation is one of the best ways to use that, okay? So don't forget to listen. Okay, so here's an actual picture of a neonatal airway. Doesn't look a lot different, it's just smaller, right? You can definitely see your vocal cords in there. This one, they've actually slid the, um, the Miller blade above the epiglottis just to, so you can visualize that epiglottis there. It is much floppier, it is bigger. But that's essentially what you'll see when you're looking in that airway. That's a great visualization, meaning you shouldn't have any difficult getting your tube in if you can see it. There we go. Now we need to secure the endotracheal tube. This is a different type of securing device other than tapes. It's called a neobar. I have one here. So this would be a good size. I'm coming back, George. For hand here. So it goes on their cheeks, the tube comes out, and then is secured to this neo bar. Okay. Sometimes that's an easier way to tape them than using actual tapes. It does, however, um, because the skin on their cheeks is a bit loose, it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to maintain in this new spot. So there's for sure a technique to using them. And don't forget to hold on. So in adults, we're a little bit less concerned if that 